So our purpose today, among other things, is to anticipate and plan for what, what might occur following the litigation which is now before the court in British Columbia. And this session will look specifically at legislative and policy options available to us if the Charter challenges liberalizing private finance for Medicare are successful. And we're very fortunate to have three panelists who are by their experience and their research particularly able to provide examples of how two-tier or prominent private participation in healthcare are regulated at present. In other words, why don't we look at what's going on now in terms of two-tier, in terms of private uh, sector financing, to determine whether there are lessons that we can draw from what is happening at present, or information that can guide us toward making sensible decisions when the time comes to grapple with the reality of an increased role for the private sector in healthcare. The first example will be drawn from Ontario practices in home care. Home care, as you know, is not within the Medicare system. There is both public and private delivery on a parallel basis. And so it provides an opportunity to look at how that's going. Are there inequalities? Um, what about regulation? What about access? What can we learn? And, and to examine this question or these questions, we turn to Sarah Allen. Sarah is at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. After being awarded her doctorate at the London School of Economics, she devoted her research to health policy, health economics, health system performance, and the comparative analysis of health systems around the world. She's recently focused on equity in pharmacare and home care and system efficient efficiency generally. Ontario is the only province with comprehensive data with respect to private and public delivery of home care, so Sarah will devote her analysis to that, and we look forward to her presentation in that regard. Another lesson we can learn, or another area which is fertile for analysis, is the regulation of private health care. What are the different models? How do they perform? Which is to be preferred? And in that context, we're fortunate to be able to refer for advice to Vanessa Grubin, our second panelist. Uh, Vanessa will look at self-regulation as a means of regulating privately financed Medicare in the context of assisted human reproduction and more particularly, IVF clinics. Does the regulation in this sector work? What lessons can be learned from private providers who are now self-regulating? Can we rely upon that model? Or must we look beyond it? Vanessa, I'm proud to say, is uh, one of my colleagues at the Faculty of Law, University of Ottawa. She's with the Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics. After clerking in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, she practiced with a national firm in litigation before joining the Faculty of Law. And she now devotes her academic work, teaching and research to health law, and in particular, the regulation of assisted human reproductions. And we look forward to Vanessa's presentation. The third area where we'll look to existing practice to determine whether lessons can be learned is to the practice in England of contracting between uh, relevant parties and the provision of health services. If the courts invalidate the laws that limit providers' ability to engage in dual practice, 
can we, by using UK-style contracts, achieve the kind of order uh, that we seek? Have they succeeded in the UK? If not, why not? Are they a device to which we should look to help us in this connection? And to help respond to those questions, we are fortunate to have on the panel Brian Thomas, a senior research fellow at the Center for Health Policy, Health Law, Policy and Ethics here at the University of Ottawa, an adjunct professor uh, and a colleague at the Faculty of Law. Um, Brian has uh, devoted his work to Canadian and comparative health law and policy, uh, looking at global health care. And uh, in addition to that, the role of religious argument in legal and political discourse, uh, which may find uh, a place in the discussion which we have now undertaken. So those are your panelists. Uh, those are their topics. And I speak for all of you in say, saying that I very much look forward to these presentations. May I call then upon Sarah to begin with her presentation. Thank you, Alan, for that um, very uh, thoughtful summary and introduction. Um, and thank you, Colleen, for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, it's been a very um, uh, mind-opening uh, day and a half, and um, I'm really privileged to be positioned among such distinguished leaders in this field. I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, David Rudoller, who's here in the room today, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge our institutions, but all the ideas and errors are our own. Um, I will begin to, um, by providing a bit of an overview of what I will talk about today. First, I'll set the context to explain uh, in what way home care is two-tiered. Um, some of you may be more familiar with home care than others from personal experience or from your research. Um, and then I'll describe the study, what question we're trying to address. Um, and the central focus is around equity and how services are used with a specific interest in uh, inequalities by income. A uh, snapshot of the results, we do see that home care use does vary by income, and, uh, but we don't really have any conclusions on equity, more like questions that we are raising that uh, we'd like to continue to um, explore with this research. And I'll end with some implications uh, and open up for discussion and hear your thoughts. I'm looking forward to uh, some discussion on this topic. So to begin with, uh, to set the stage, we have a um, public home care system. It's publicly funded, and I'm focusing mostly on Ontario. Uh, it uh, will be the focus of this, this work, and it, but it does apply to other provinces, but they have their own legislation and, and arrangements for home care. Uh, eligibility is based on need um, and uh, not on residency, like with the um, Medicare system, and there's um, efforts to contain costs through what's called service maxima, a maximum hours that you will be eligible for once you've been assessed. And this uh, service maximum really gives rise to an active private sector, as has been described in the media and by advocacy organizations, but hasn't really been explored in the academic literature. And I find it's an interesting question about how these uh, sectors interact and what impact that may have on equity. It's also interesting in the international context where Canada is um, unusual, again, um, in their design of their home care system, where um, most countries rely on containing costs in the public system by using co-pays, and uh, many of those are income scaled. Um, whereas Canada has chosen to contain the budget with these service maxima. And uh, only two other countries in the OECD, according to a recent study, Slovenia and Korea, have chosen this approach. Um, all the others rely on co-pays. Co um, and this does raise a question of how the private sector is used to either top up, so when people hit that maximum, uh, they might require additional services, and if they're able to pay for them, they can um, top up that uh, public, serve, public um, 
care, and the alternative is that some people might just opt out completely. And there's not much evidence to support the, you know, whether these are large private sectors. Um, as I said, there hasn't been a lot of uh, scholarship on this topic, but um, there's reason to believe that there, you know, anecdotal evidence that there's ev both types of privately funded uh, home care that's operating alongside this uh, public system. And what's interesting to note is that the system's been relatively stable since uh, the legislation um, underlying the public system in 1994. There have been very little changes to the way home care is organized in Ontario. There's been continual investment in home care and a growing recognition that this could be a way to relieve pressure on the acute system to deal with overcrowding in hospitals. We should be investing in, in the home care. And there's been pan-Canadian effort to, um, in, in addition to federal funding, to improve post-acute home care in particular. And in spite of all these investments and increasing in funding and increasing in the number of people that are being served, the proportion of home care um, in the total budget of health care remains pretty stable at around between 4 and 5 percent, depending on how much community care is included in that estimate. And it's difficult to compare across countries, but this places Ontario and Canada in the lower end of the um, sort of OECD country uh, range. And uh, others in the room know more about the international context for home care, but uh, this is the um, the current state is that in investment is, uh, is growing, but it's growing at about the same rate as the other sectors. And home care is diverse. It uh, does include the post-acute care that has been receiving a lot of attention. It also includes long-term care. And it covers both health, and you know that includes professions such as nursing and rehab and occupational therapy, physiotherapy, social workers. It also includes personal support services and social support services that are delivered by primarily personal support workers. And those professions are uh, changing over time. Um, the data that we have available are on those regulated professions. So I kindly, um, I, my colleagues at Kaihai kindly provided some data to show who's providing home care in Ontario and how it's changing over time. And uh, the professions who are involved in the home health care uh, include registered nurses, uh, practical nurses, and OTs and PTs. These are the professions with which we can identify where they're working. And uh, if you look at just the head counts um, per capita, you can see that it, there's been a shift away from the registered nurses over time toward slightly toward practical nurses. But what we're missing is a growing role for personal support workers. Um, but you can see there's, there's an evolution in, in the provision and the supply side, but there's not much. Um, uh, I, I don't have much more information than, than this, other than to, sh to show that it's changing to, in a way to um, reduce, uh, I guess, contain costs by shifting away from the higher cost providers. So this context and the interaction between the public sector and the private sector has been the theme of this conference. And it's given, uh, raises lots of interesting questions that we can study empirically or at least we'd like to study empirically, but we're really limited by the data available. As Alan mentioned, it's really hard to find data on both the public home care services and the private uh, home care services. And there's been a lot of research looking into the public sector and who's using home care services, how their characteristics have changed over time. They become increasingly complex. Um, the, looking at what factors might improve access to home care in the public sector but not to look at who's using and how, how large is that private sector and what impact does that have on, on equity. So we come to, to the study that I'm going to describe today, which is uh, drawing on the one data source I found that includes uh, information on public and private home care services. Um, it's a survey of the Canadian population living in the community. And in Ontario, there's data on home care use for the period 2007 to 2015. And by pooling those years, we can get about 40, over 40,000 older adults, age 65 and over. 
So we're really interested in using this data to see how the use of um, home care services vary by income and to see how those vary by types of uh, services. So broadly, the methods we took were to um, outline the various options that people have when they need home care services. And among those options, we've identified you no know home care, so that could be a choice or it could be uh, access challenges. They could choose to, uh, to use public home care. And again, it might not be a choice, but that could be what, what they end up uh, receiving because they've been referred or, uh, through a hospital or they've referred themselves at their um, health region. Uh, they could choose to opt out of the public system and hire a nurse or a personal support worker to meet their needs um, independently and uh, you know, not even go on the queue for home care uh, in the public sector at all. Or they might um, use both the public and the private uh, home care um, systems and in that uh, model of topping up, the supplementary model of uh, private care where um, people might meet a maximum and they're, um, you know, as they're uh, assessed and then top it up with the private care or face barriers in terms of the wait times and so on and uh, use, use private care. So because there's these different options, we can model this empirically with a uh, multinomial logit model. And we also, we, we're aware that it's important to do a few things, which is to, um, if you're looking at income and health, these are very closely related. So in a multivariate context, we can control for things that are um, predictive of need for home care use, like your activities of daily living and self-assessed health, um, whether you're living alone, um, rurality, and uh, um, receiving informal care or unpaid care. So we can control for those factors in order to identify any systematic variations by income. And then we need to look at home care separately for the health or professional services and for the social services. Uh, or personal services, and that the literature has identified some reasons to, to do so. They're, although they're um, in the same legislative framework in Ontario in terms of the public system, there is a sort of a gray area with social support and um, social assistance services that are offered um, that uh, are often contracted, and they c there can be co-pays, and there's no limit to. Um, or there's there's no requirement that within the public system there ha there have to be no copays as as the public le legislation um, dictates. So this is what we've done, and to to give you a sense, the summary of the trends over time, uh, we've plotted the percent of seniors in this sample who've reported to have used uh, public home care in the last year, and who have reported to use private home care in the last year over time. So for each year, we can see those numbers. Um, and I think this pointer is working. So I don't know if this helps. But OK, so the top line is the public, and the bottom line is the private. <laughs> and you can see that the private, the percentage of seniors using either um, public or private is quite low. It's uh, in 2014, it was 7%. Um, but overall, there seems to be a bit of a downward trend in the proportion of seniors who are using public, uh, publicly fi funded health home care and a slight increase in the uh, proportion of seniors who are using private home care. So remember, there's been an increase in public spending in, um, in, in, pub in Ontario's home care sector increasing number of clients who are being served, as reported by the Office of the Auditor General of Ontario. And yet, we see this declining um, trend in the percentage of seniors who are using. So there seems to be a concentration of those uh, services within a, a smaller group of seniors. This corresponds to the literature where there's been an increasing complexity within these populations. And at the same time, what we, we can also see is this rising um, use of, of private services, and, albeit small. It's 2.6% um, 2, 2 of Ontarians, uh, senior Ontarians, re reporting to have used private home care in the last year. Uh, so the next, 
I'll show you a, um, another figure that reports predictive margins. So what is this? It's basically the uh, percentage of the seniors that um, by income quintile, which you were already um, uh, shown by, by Zainab this morning, um, same concept. So the lowest income seniors will be in Q1 and the highest income seniors in Q5. So the predictive margins would be the from this multinomial regression, you can control for all these things that impact home care use and just looked at the independent effect of income. So if all people were in that Q1, we would have uh, f just about 4% uh, reporting to use only public home care services. And in contrast, we have a slightly higher uh, percent who would, who, um, would report to use only public, public home care in uh, Q5, although this is not a big noticeable, it's, a, it's not a statistically significant difference. So in terms of achieving some kind of goal of equity, are we delivering on the, according to need? Generally, the public um, home care system to see, seems to be doing so. But what's interesting is this private, um, you know, the impact of um, private seems to be relatively uh, consistent across income groups where there's, uh, even in the lowest income group for seniors, we're seeing uh, over 1% of seniors are using the private system. And this isn't that different across the income quintiles. So there is this private market, but f some people are choosing to opt out and even those who have very little income are choosing to use their uh, income and, and disposable income to purchase home care privately. It signals potentially um, shortcomings in the, public, in the public system. So I will leave it there. I'm at zero. <laughs> and uh, I think the implications could be part of our discussion um, where we see this uh, uh, interesting case of home care where in, there's an existing two-tier two -tier model um, and we would like to be able to speak to the impact of using home, home care services on ultimate health outcomes and how those differ by income as well in order to draw more conclusions on equity. So thank you very much. Well, just well, the slides are coming. Um, I'd just like to thank Alan for the introduction and Colleen for the invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so I've been asked to speak about some of the lessons that we can learn from the regulation or lack thereof, spoiler alert, um, of fertility services um, in Canada. And so my focus this afternoon is going to be on the regulation of the delivery of these private services, not the way in which they're um, financed. Um, and uh, I'll give a little bit of background about how, uh, how fertility clinics operate um, uh, across the country and then talk about some of the, the shortcomings from a regulatory perspective. Um, so as many of you know, uh, fertility services are among the relatively few healthcare services that are for the most part privately paid for and occur in private clinics. So these are private, this is private for-profit uh, healthcare. There are a few exceptions, such, such as the recent IVF funding program in Quebec, which is now defunct, and our relatively new IVF funding program in Ontario, but it's still quite um, early days. Um, but because, um, fertility clinics are for the most part private and for profit, they fall outside uh, of the same, the, the government mechanisms that apply to publicly paid for or um, publicly delivered healthcare services. And so they reveal some of the um, potential gaps that might apply to other private for profit medical services should a more robust second tier uh, of privately financed healthcare take hold in Canada. 
So a little bit about fertility clinics. So how are they regulated? Um, well, there are a number of regulatory mechanisms that apply, but as I've mentioned, most of these fall outside of the provincial laws and regulations that apply to hospitals and clinics that are providing publicly funded services. The most tightly regulated system is in Quebec, and that arose largely as a result of the funding program that applied there. That was really when we saw the uh, provincial government take a very close um, look at the regulation uh, of clinics. And so we do have a, quite a detailed regulatory framework in Quebec that's applied um, by virtue of the Ministry of Health and Social Services. By contrast, if we look at Ontario, um, Ontario fertility clinics, like other private for-profit clinics, fall outside of the Public Hospitals Act and the Independent Health Facilities Act. And those are the two pieces of legislation that really do provide a very detailed framework for governing hospitals and clinics that offer publicly funded health care services. And they include a whole host of standards, provisions for auditing, inspections. It's, they're both pretty significant pieces of legislation, and they also provide important penalties for not complying with those um, statutes. So what's, what's happened in, for, to, for, to fertility clinics? Well, for the most part, it has fallen to the self-regulating colleges, most specifically the College of Physicians and Surgeons, to develop regulations around these professionals and the facilities where these um, uh, fertility, uh, fertility care is being delivered. Um, the professional organization, which is the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society, so not a, a self-regulatory mechanism per se, but it has also, as I'm gonna mention in a few minutes, has played a really important uh, regulatory role in terms of filling a number of the gaps that exist because the provincial government has taken in a relatively hands-off approach to regulation here. Um, I, I also want to mention, although I don't have time to, to talk about it today, is that fertility clinics are also um, uh, importantly regulated through voluntary accreditation. Um, they have worked uh, quite closely with Accreditation Canada to develop voluntary standards by which the clinics can be um, accredited. But again, this is uh, external to our uh, provincial mechanisms. So a couple of words about self-regulation. Um, so as, as we know, self-regulation is the ability of healthcare professionals to regulate their own members of their profession. Um, and it is an important regulatory mechanism. It's an, it's an important regulatory mechanism, not only in this context, but for all forms of healthcare delivery. And I'm gonna focus on physicians, but of course this applies to nurses, physiotherapists, and the other regulated health professions across the country. Um, so physicians, whether they're practicing in the publicly funded system or delivering these private health care services, are bound by their respective regulatory colleges. And, you know, I do want to say there are a number of good reasons for self-regulation, a number of important rationales. Um, professional self-regulation does play an important regulatory role. It's seen as important because professionals have the expertise and the special knowledge needed to set standards for medical practice and to determine whether those standards have been met or not. Um, those standards may also be considered to be more acceptable when, by those professionals when they're developed by their members of their own profession as opposed to external bodies who don't necessarily have the same level of expertise. It's been argued that self-regulation is, is an important way to avoid the politicization of medical standards in terms of um, when they apply and how they are developed. And there is also um, some argument that professionals should be permitted to resolve problems within their own profession before external regulatory mechanisms apply. So if a member falls below a particular standard of conduct, that the college should have an opportunity to address that um, conduct um, before there are external processes. And so as a result, self-regulating colleges, they discharge a number of functions from registration to education. I'm today gonna focus on the complaints process because I think that's one of the, the most crucial processes in terms of um, comparing private for-profit and publicly um, provided services. And I'm also gonna look at um, the relatively unique experience in Ontario of the CPSO regulating pri these private for-profit premises. 
So in terms of the complaint processes through the regulatory colleges, essentially what their purpose is, is to ensure that the members of the profession practice to a certain standard and that there are appropriate remedial tools and disciplinary tools to address any unethical, immoral, or incompetent practices. But there are a number of concerns with these complaint processes in, the context, in this context. And of course, these concerns also exist when we're talking about publicly funded healthcare but I want to emphasize that they're really amplified or more acute when self-regulation is the principal or only way in which a particular healthcare service is being regulated. And there's no government tools or regulatory instruments that are reinforcing or buttressing these uh, complaint processes. So what are some of the criticisms of, this, um, of these college complaint process? Well, there's a number of complaints or concerns around the actual processes in themselves, that they're onerous for patients, that they're opaque. Um, so, for example, complaints have to be brought by individual patients. There's no compensation in these contexts. These process do, processes do not provide compensation um, for patients. You know, I have to say the college does have a mandate to undertake its own investigations. It's not sole, strictly through patient complaints, but that um, regulatory function is seldom exercised by the college. It's only in really egregious cases that a college will undertake uh, an audit or uh, of a particular member's practice. Um, the complaint processes are not uh, particularly well known. Um, so for example, I was recently giving a presentation somewhere else on assisted reproduction and there was a woman there who had donated her eggs. She was an egg donor. And she had expressed concern that her physician had given her more medication than was needed in order to stimulate her ovaries. And as a result, she felt that she had produced more than the safe number of eggs, which led to um, a syndrome called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, OHSS. It's a serious condition. It can be fatal. Um, and she asked me, she said, well, you're a lawyer. What can I do about this? I said, well, you could bring a complaint to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And she was, she was actually quite surprised that that was something that was uh, open to her. Um, and you know, this was a very bright wo young woman who was an advocate for many, many other egg donors, and she simply wasn't aware of this process. Another complaint uh, around, or a concern around um, self-regulation is about the actual dispositions, um, that the remedial or educational dispositions might not be considered to be sufficiently strong, that they're not severe enough. Um, and there's, you know, what's equally troubling is that those educational dispositions and cautions, so we're not talking about suspensions or uh, an individual losing their license, that until quite recently in Ontario, those did not appear on a member's public record. So an individual would, an individual patient could look their proposed practitioner up and actually not see that that member, there was an educational disposition uh, against that member or, a, or a, a caution, which is essentially being scolded by the college. So there are some concerns about uh, this complaints process. So the second um, example that I want to provide, the second cautionary tale, is uh, around um, premises, around the clinics themselves. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, fertility clinics currently fall outside of the Public Hospitals Act, the Independent Health Facilities Act in Ontario. That appears to be changing. There's some new legislation on the horizon and some new regulations which may capture um, fertility clinics. But I think we have some, there are some really important lessons to be learned from the current framework that applies. Uh, and that framework uh, falls under the jurisdiction of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. So the college here um, is, has designed a program called the Out of Hospital Premises Inspection Program, the OPIP. Um, and essentially what this program does is it applies to facilities that deliver a certain type of anesthetic, which means that it doesn't matter if it's privately financed or publicly financed, private uh, uh, or a uh, publicly delivered service, um, 
that there will be certain standards that apply to that clinic. And so cosmetic surgery clinics, um, laser types of clinics, uh, fertility clinics, all of these private for-profit clinics are now at, at the very least caught under these standards. And these standards, though, really apply to the anesthesia portion of the practice. They're not broad-based, uh, it's not a broad-based detailed framework. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's, it's not the same, uh, it's not nearly as rigorous as what we see um, in the public sector. Um, so, we see a role for, for the colleges. The other, um, you know, closely related to self-regulation, and it, it, which has really started to play a very important role in the regulation of fertility um, practice in Canada is clinical practice guidelines. And these have been developed through the professional association, the CFAS, um, that has really sought to develop these clinical practice guidelines in order to shore up the lack of regulation in this area. And again, there's no question that clinical practice guidelines are important regulatory tools. They're intended to promote consistent, high quality care. They're based on or intended to be based on up-to-date medical evidence. Um, but again, they fall short in several respects. And as we see here, the CFAS has been quite busy over the last five years or so generating these clinical practice guidelines to provide some guidance to their members about very important areas of practice which might otherwise be regulated and are regulated by the public sector where they're publicly paid for. So for example, things like multiple embryo transfer, which I'm gonna talk about in a couple of minutes in a bit more detail, um, third party reproductions, the use of donor sperm and eggs. Um, so, you know, as I say, there's little, there's little question that these clinical practice guidelines are important, but they do suffer from a variety of shortcomings. Um, you know, we, there isn't a consistent, coherent practice in terms of the development of clinical practice guidelines in terms of the expertise of its members, whether they might be subject to influence from industry or other stakeholders. There's been questions about transparency until very recently. These practice guidelines were available to CFAS members only. So members of the public, patients, were not aware of what the standards of care were that applied to the care they were receiving from their physicians. So again, important, but concerning when they are the, you know, primary, one of the primary regulatory tools. Um, there's also question about the efficacy of these clinical practice guidelines. Um, and I, I just want to talk about, give multiple embryo transfer as an example here, because it's a very interesting, um, I think it, it's a nice illustration of, uh, cautionary tale of uh, what uh, what needs to happen in terms of regulation. So multiple embryo transfer refers to the decision about whether you're going to implant one embryo or more after a cycle of IVF. So if you put more than one embryo back in the uterus, there's an increased chance of having twins or triplets or more. And it is well documented that multiple embryo transfer and multiple gestations have very important health risks associated with this practice. Um, for the mother, there's maternal hypertension, thank you, um, preeclampsia, anemia, for the baby, low birth weight, premature birth. So an, a couple of governments, for example, the government of Quebec, when it um, enacted its uh, funding policy, forbade multiple embryo transfer. It required single embryo transfer, one transfer of an embryo at a time for all cycles of IVF in the province. The CFAS, a few years later, brought in a clinical practice guideline, very similar recommendations. And yet when you look at the data from 2014, the year after the guideline applies, the multiple embryo transfer rate in Quebec is very low about 3.4%, and by contrast, in the rest of Canada, was four times higher. So the efficacy of these clinical practice guidelines are clearly um, questionable as compared to uh, some public regulation. Uh, I'm just gonna skip over the information um, collection piece, but it's, uh, it's another example of where greater regulation is required. 
So just in conclusion, you know, self-regulation is an important tool, regulatory tool, but it is in and of itself an insufficient mechanism to regulate the private for profit sector. Some form of external regulation is necessary. Um, and really, I, I can't emphasize enough that provincial governments need to uh, resist the narrative or position that the government should play a less uh, rigorous regulatory role in this sector simply because they aren't paying for it. Thanks very much. Hello, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here among this esteemed uh, panel. Um, thanks to Colleen for organizing and inviting me. Um, so I want to talk today about the use of physician contracts as a method to restrict some of the, or to sort of address some of the fears related to um, two-tier care. And I'm going to look in some detail at the UK, although I actually want to look a little more broadly to uh, the use of contracting across Europe. Um, so just to kind of give a sense of our motivation for this, as, as this has been explained previously at this conference, but um, so you, you've got this situation now in Canada where we, where, you know, the, as Danielle explained at the, key, at the keynote panel yesterday, that we've got this situation in Canada where the where a big part of sort of what maintains the Medicare system, the, the single payer system, is a, just the, the practice of regulating physicians, right? It's not, it's not all about financing. It's also a matter of controlling what physicians can do. And one of the pieces of that is controlling physicians from being able to engage in uh, what is called dual practice or moonlighting. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, you will know that the restrictions on dual practice are now under challenge in the Canby trial, which is that's one of the points that differentiates uh, Canby from the earlier Shaoli challenge, which dealt with private insurance. That so the Canby trial is trying to knock down these further re restrictions on dual practice and statutory restrictions on uh, extra billing. So, so our sort of thinking about this was well, okay, if if Canby succeeds here, then what are what are the fallback options for the provinces in terms of uh, limiting uh, dual practice and sort of limiting the proliferation of a, a two-tier care. Um, and it, so what instructed our thinking a bit was just the thought that in these trials, the reasoning typically is someone like Brian Day will stand up and point to, the exam to examples of Western European countries, and they'll notice the small piece of the puzzle, namely that uh, private insurance is allowed or that two-tier care is allowed formally. But they won't notice the, all the other pieces of the puzzle that in various ways restrict uh, the role of, of two, uh, the possibility for two-tier care. And so, and one of those other pieces is the use of contracts to, uh, to limit uh, what physicians can do. Um, so that's what's got us thinking about this question. And so we, we specifically wanted to look at the case of the UK initially because the UK does well in international comparisons or, or did until recently. Uh, they seem to be kind of a crisis mode with the NHS presently. But, um, but so that was our starting point of looking at this, and we started looking more broadly into European approaches. So let me just, as a kind of starting point, let me talk a little bit about why you would want to regulate dual practice. And this is wh whether you'd want to do it by, by statute, which we currently do under in many provinces, or whether you'd want to do it by contracts, or whether you'd want to do it by some other policy mechanism. Just wh what is the reason? That, what is the ground reason that you would not want to allow dual practice? So there's, the, there's a kind of small and and often overly theoretical literature. I mean, I, I mean that by that I mean that it discussions of dual practice are often not situated in any particular healthcare system. So you get these kind of abstract arguments about these sort of imaginary physicians in a system of a, you know, uh, and that's not very helpful because you always want to know like what are the other pieces in this puzzle that are that will create incentives or disincentives for dual practice. But um, so I'm going to give a kind of really short potted version of the kind of findings that we've seen. Um, so uh, probably the primary concern with dual practice is the simple concern that if you have dual practice, a physician who's engaged in, who has a public and a private practice will simply prioritize their private patients because they're more lucrative, right? And so that will mean that wait times grow. If you have a fixed number of physicians, wait times will grow for it within the... Uh, within the public system. And there's some evidence for this. So there's a great Duckett, uh, Stephen Duckett paper from 2005, I think, in CMAJ. This was after the Australian developments that we heard about uh, this morning, uh, showing that, in, that you know, wait times for physicians who engage in dual practice, the, the wait times for public 
patients lengthened. There's some evidence, limited evidence, uh, and the interpretation of this is controversial, but evidence from Manitoba and Alberta when those provinces had brief experiments with allowing private or allowing dual practice for cataract surgery, and they found that uh, dual practice cataract surgeons had, uh, you know, the wait time for private cataract surgery was a week, for public surgery was 13 weeks, so there was this kind of disparity. Now, a confounding factor is that or some people have theorized that, well, these might have just been like the most popular cataract surgeons so that they would have just had long wait times. And that, so that, that's a confounding factor. We don't know what, whether the availability of dual, dual practice was the sole driver of the long wait times for those physicians. But anyway, so that's, that's the one concern that you're just going to, this is probably the most common concern we're, you're probably familiar with, that longer wait times in the public system if you allow dual practice. Um, a second concern, and this is, comes out in the NHS literature, um, is just this concern that if you allow dual practice, any physician who's engaged in dual practice will then be put in a conflict of interest where they, it's no longer in their interest to see wait times be short in the NHS because the longer wait times get, the worse the quality of care in the NHS becomes, the more demand there is for their more lucrative private side care. So that's a conflict of interest argument. Uh, a third consideration is that if you allow dual practice, the the strongest draw to do a practice will be to the most senior physicians with the best reputations, so that you know they'll they'll be the ones to, to migrate first to the to private side, and they'll and that'll have a kind of drain quality of care from the the public side. Um, and this the kind of related concern is that once they get to that private side, they'll they'll sort of as Fiona was describing this morning, they will have an incentive to sort of cream skim the easiest cases that they can find um, from the public system. So you so you you're taking the arguably the most talented physicians in your system, bring them over to, to a private side where they're earning a lot of money doing the simplest work. It's, the whole dynamic seems off, uh, or seems uh, not to be in patient's interest. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a kind of potted, or very short history or explanation of the uh, concern, underlying concerns here. Um, so I just want to take sort of briefly touch on, oh my god, I'm not, here we go. I wanted to briefly, briefly touch on the question of since um, Vanessa was talking about the strong role of self-regulation in Canada, a question you might ask is, why don't we just leave this to self-regulation by physicians, right? The, and there's some, you, you can read the Canadian Medical Association's Code of Ethics in a way that, in, in ways that may indicate that, that it is un, unethical by the physician standards to, to engage in um, dual practice because they do have a principles against conflict of interest. The code of ethics discourages cream skimming, which is a, a consequence of dual practice, uh, as I say. And um, there's a general call within their code of ethics for physicians to promote equitable access to healthcare resources, and presumably that means irrespective of cost. So, so this it would be to be a dual practice physician is arguably, at least in a system that has wait times, uh, that is just unethical by the standards of uh, the Canadian medical profession. But I think. There's some reason for skepticism as to whether we could rely on that alone to allow, to rely on physicians to sort of self-police against the, the, this temptation. And uh, I mean, my main uh, small reason for thinking that is that I just wonder about about individual patients' ability to sort of complain about this or to even notice the problem. I mean, you, you make a phone call to try to set up an appointment with a dual practice physician, and they tell you it's a long wait, and how, there's no you don't have any easy way to figure out whether the problem is due to some. Uh, cream skimming and all these unethical behaviors or whether it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a black box as far as you know. So it's hard to kind of launch a disciplinary process uh, over something like that. Um, and the other concern is just that in the jurisdictions that have stronger restrictions on um, dual practice, we, even there we see physicians shirking and, and going multiple times the amount that they're supposed to be engaging in dual practice. So, so this is, just doesn't seem like a place where we want to sort of trust physicians to their own uh, ethics. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the UK, along with many uh, Western European countries, have pursued this strategy of restricting dual practice contractually. Um, we initially became interested in the UK experience because the US uh, has ranked very high international rankings and actually has a good reputation for uh, getting its wait times under control. I, I know that there's recent, uh, this has turned around a little bit in recent years, but uh, at the time we undertook this research initially, that was the case. Um, so the, the st and another detail here is that the UK has actually had a kind of interesting policy debate about restricting dual practice in over the past 20 years. So and and this mainly has been expressed in, in changes to their contracts with um, with specialists. So we're talking about uh, surgeons in hospitals. Um, <clears throat> so until 2003, uh, the the contract for full-time consultants uh, allowed 
allowed physicians to engage in dual practice, but limited that to their ability to only 10% of their annual earnings, right? So uh, then the, the problem with that arrangement was that uh, the rule was just routinely broken, right? And there, there was just no mechanism in place to, to be sort of overseeing how physicians were spending their time or knowing when they were in the, when they were, had migrated into uh, uh, private, uh, the private side of their practice and so on. So, and there was, there was emerging evidence that this was sort of, that uh, physicians shirking into the, uh, into the private tier was kind of uh, resulting in them not fulfilling their work commitments to the NHS. Uh, so, there was just a growing sense that there needed to be more accountability and that there needed to be uh, more oversight over this. And so in the, with the launch of their new 2003 uh, consultants contract, uh, they put in a new system which did away with the 10% restriction. So you were now in theory free to engage as much as you liked in, in private practice as an NHS uh, uh, consultant. But alongside that, they introduced a, a brand new set of sort of robust uh, job requirements and new managerial oversight that made it um, th that made it so that you basically had to consult with a clinical a clinical manager who would oversee who would develop a work a very detailed 40 hour work week plan with you this is if you're a full-time consultant um, and hold you to it and moreover you would have to anytime you were engaging in 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 private practice you would have to report to your clinical manager and you know address any potential conflicts of interest so there in other words, the solution was just to introduce a whole lot of transparency around the use of private, uh, um, uh, private practice and also uh, impose a 40-hour work week, which just limited the amount of time that people had to, to um, engage in private practice. So that is the, that's the NHS system. Uh, sorry. So broadly speaking, the, these restrictions on dual practice sort of fall into two categories. There are restrictive approaches and incentive-based approaches. So uh, I'm just going to walk you through the two of them. So a restrictive approach, as you might understand or you might expect, is uh, just a range of different ways of just basically binding physicians against the opportunities to engage in dual practice. So there's a spectrum of these. There are exclusivity contracts. So you, if you want to work in the public system, you sign a contract saying, I will not engage whatsoever in private practice. So that um, that is one option. The concern with that, we've seen in some countries, in Greece and some other countries, uh, there, are, there are occasions where physicians will just leave the public system, but they say, well, if that's the offer, then I'm not going to take it. I'll just go to the, pro to the private side. And I think in the Canadian context, the concern would be uh, that, you, that you, you could have this kind of forum shopping between provinces as well, since we have a federated system. So you, you may want some national coordination on this. Um, a second option here is to limit private practice income. I just discussed this in the context of the NHS's pre-2003 rule. Uh, and I mentioned the main problem with this, uh, for the, at least for the NHS, was monitoring it and having some system of accountability. And they moved to a system of much stronger managerial oversight to address that problem. Um, a third option is to limit the amount of time that physicians can devote to private practice. So you, the Ireland had a rule of 20% uh, rule. Um, an upside of this maybe is that it allows senior surgeons with great reputations to uh, still sort of wet their beaks in the private market and, and, and do so to the full value, to earn as much money as they want in that section and, and still remain uh, as part of the public system as well. Um, but there's been an enforcement, there's also been enforcement issues in, in, with those time limits. Uh, Ireland's, uh, Steve, Stephen Thomas shared a paper with me where the, the this time limit was repeatedly referred to as a farce in the Irish system, so I'm not sure that it's that promising. Um, finally, the, uh, an another approach would be to restrict physicians by category somehow. So we, uh, Zainab was speaking this morning about the sector two physicians. So you, you create a category of physicians. It could be uh, new, new immigrant physicians or newly uh, certified physicians, and you say, well, these people cannot engage in dual practice, and then for more senior physicians, you allow them, you allow them to engage in private practice. Uh, obviously, the concern, there's a concern there about um, talent migrating out of the system. Um, okay, so moving on to incentive-based approaches. Um, so another approach, instead of sort of binding physicians and sort of pr prohibiting them one way or another, you, another approach would be to say, to offer con contractual incentives. So Spain, for example, has uh, offers their phys hospital physicians an opportunity where they say, if you want to work full time for this hospital, we will give you, we will pay you more if you commit to full time, and if you sign, you sign a contract saying you will just not engage in private practice whatsoever. Um, Portugal has a sort of tiered system where 
the more time you commit to the public system, the more time you um, sort of if you sort of commit full time, you make a higher amount per hour, and it's sort of tiered down like that. So that your level of commitment raises your uh, level of remuneration. So uh, that's a very quick run through of these different approaches to contracting uh, to limit dual practice. Uh, given the sort of uh, the various options here and the, the sort of limitations of data, we don't have any sort of strong prescriptions on what Canada should do in terms of approaching this. I mean, the, we just wanted to—I just wanted to mention a few of the concerns that are the, the challenge that would uh, be raised by trying to bring this approach to Canada. Uh, so I suppose a key challenge is that Canada has a, has historically and uh, has a fee for service billing system primarily for 70% of physicians or so uh, and it's something that as we know from the dawn of Medicare physicians have been very guarded about this they like the professional autonomy that comes from being able to set up your own shop and not work under not not be subjected to the kind of managerial control that we see under the say, the current NHS system so uh, but uh, I mean on the bright side this maybe you know, there are lots of people who think that the fee for service system is is a poorly designed system that results in a lot of physician-induced demand and so on, and so maybe this would be an opportunity uh, to sort of do away with that system and, and introduce something new, introduce more managerial control over physicians in exchange for their, this freedom to uh, engage in dual practice. Um, uh, for, I guess a further concern is just that the that any new attempt to sort of reproduce these provincial restrictions uh, via contract may itself invite uh, legal challenges of one sort or another. We know that the physicians in Ontario have fought back, use, or have attempted to fight back using the charter against changes to their contract and uh, presumably a move to do away with this time-honored system of fee-for-service billing and so on would, would invite whatever legal challenges there are available. Um, but anyway, so all of this to say that we think this is an interesting avenue for a potentially a new sort of grand bargain in Canadian Medicare between physicians and, and uh, Canadians and uh, that that we should be thinking about these problems if you know if if the if the pieces of the puzzle that we that have formed part of the architecture of Medicare are going to be taken away via the charter then we really need to look at these foreign systems and these al alternative measures to uh, maintain a single tier system or single pair system thank you thank you Brian Vanessa Sarah Time now for questions. If those who'd like to pose questions would line up at the mic. We'll call upon you first. Adrian. Hi, Ivy Bergeau. Um, Vanessa is wondering if you are able to speak to the issue of Dr. Marwin, I believe is his name. The uh, Yes, yeah, so he's the Ottawa Fertility Clinic physician who um, was initially brought to the attention of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of yeah. Ontario in 1985, and he was not uh, taken off the register until 2014. Yeah. Uh, and for those of, who, those of you who don't know the issue, um, so far there have been 11 women that have come forward that he has impregnated them with his sperm. Um, so that kind of speaks to um, the issue around, uh, around regulation. And Brian, if you could speak to the issue of um, whether or not the contracts have any control over um, or impact on medical education because um, the uh, supervision of residents, um, I mean, the, the migration of physicians, highly skilled physicians, senior physicians into the private sector means that they may not be available to um, supervise residents. So I'm wondering if you could speak to the implications for medical education in that regard. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ivy. Uh, so I was debating about whether I was going to talk about Dr. Barwin in my prepared remarks, um, but I uh, welcome the question. So, um, you know, this again, it's sort of a good example of when self-regulation falls short um, and also the lack of regulation in the fertility um, setting. So, Doctor, this was not the first run-in that Dr. Barwin had. Yeah, f like four or five run-ins with the College of Physicians and Surgeons. A number of them don't appear on the public register because they were educational dispositions or cautions. So patients didn't know that when they were going to see him that there had been 
concerns and complaints expressed around his practice. Um, so I, I do think it's, and so the, what's currently uh, happening now, he is retired from practice. Um, he had been suspended at sort of one of those five complaints. There was a suspension, so that is the one that appears on the public register. Um, but as a result, the, the real, the only recourse the patients have at this stage is a class action. And so there is a class action, I believe there's 50 odd people who are now part of that class action um, around uh, his conduct, his misconduct with respect to um, to his fertility practice. So. Brian? Yes. Uh. Is this, oh. uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not aware of, I mean, we've done a pretty comprehensive review of the literature on this, and I'm not aware of any data on that. Of sort of, I, I would imagine, I mean, one of the points that gets made is that there, there, at least within the NHS, there is a kind of prestige to belonging part-time to the NHS so that I imagine that there's and I imagine there's a kind of prestige surrounding being uh, training new physicians so it may be that this is not a problem um, but I have not seen any data to suggest that the NHS or that any system that allows dual practice is struggling to train new people due to the migration of senior people into the private sector. Mark you have a question? I do. Uh, it's for my longtime co-author, Sarah, uh, which I like the paper a lot, and I think you're absolutely right. This is a, an area that's under-researched and difficult to get at. So my question is three parts. It's uh, how do we think about need, who pays, and equity in this space, right? And on the need side, uh, 65 is awfully young these days, as I get closer. And uh, are we underestimating, are, are we giving a, a sort of a misrepresentation of the picture by looking at 65 plus, what would it look like if we were looking at 85 uh, plus in terms of need for care? How do we think about who should pay, right? I mean, in some ways, an analogy for the home, it's not perfect, but it's like the university sector. Right? Sometimes we think, let's, let's look at the student's ability to pay. Other jurisdictions say, no, no, we have to look at the parent's ability to pay because that's where the real funding, should the, should the children be considered here in the ability to pay for home care or is it just the seniors themselves? And then how do we think about where equity might actually really hit? Uh, and, and I wonder whether or not the differences really start to materialize once people have hit those caps, right? So that, that the margin you want to look at for what's happening with private care versus completely unmet need is conditional on having hit the public cap, which my understanding is quite low. I mean, so I don't, lots of questions in there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Um, those are among many of the questions that we have and we can't yet get at, but I think the age limit is, a, is one that we can action immediately and uh, look at the over 85 or even the over 80 group because they are more uh, the target for home care and uh, the publicly available data suggests that the median age is increasing over time and uh, there's um, an increasing complexity and it's devoted to the older population. So we can do that. We haven't done that yet. Um, and I, I agree with you completely that the interesting question is around this uh, who, you know, once you get to that maximum, what do you do? And I think my hypothesis is that those lower income seniors hit the maximum and then they're basically pushed into long term care facilities. First, they're on a wait list for a few years and either they're waiting at home and uh, you know, spending their uh, children's um, earnings and getting a lot of unpaid care to remain there, or they're waiting in a hospital. And those who, the higher income seniors, once they reach those maximums, they are paying privately from one of the 350 private nursing agencies in Toronto, and in Ontario rather, and uh, can stay at home much longer. So I'm really interested in that question of how long people are able to stay in their homes when they choose to and how that varies systematically by income and any advice on how to marry the public data which we have great rich data on assessment uh, the rye and uh, other tools that are available but with the private and how can we um, combine those I welcome your your input but thank you for those suggestions yes sir Michael Wolfson uh, Two things. First, for, for Sarah, start out with a little techie thing. Uh, I wonder if the negative conclusion about the impact of income on the utilization is because seniors typically have a far more compressed distribution of income. They're getting OAS and maybe CPP and GIS, but their other incomes are, are not nearly as large. So the omission of, for example, savings or wealth, if you had those uh, data, 
and I can't resist adding, given what you were just saying, is you know there is the interi, but we're really lacking lots of data, you know, longitudinally linked data, for example. Uh, uh, for Vanessa, you know, I guess my question is who who should regulate the regulators? You know, you were referring to the College of uh, Physicians or the colleges across the country, and it seems to me that uh, they have a kind of interesting incentive structure. There's certainly, from the point of view of the community of doctors, an incentive to weed out bad apples, as long as they're a very tiny fraction of the overall uh, community. But if one is dealing with more systemic or broader issues that affect the community of physicians as a whole, uh, the incentive seems to me to go in completely opposite direction. And I have to remember the fact that uh, before the Supreme Court struck down the, whatever it's called, assisted human reproduction, uh, organization, there were plans afoot actually to collect a bunch of data. Um, and interestingly, to bring in another strand, uh, my recollection is that it was the Health Canada lawyers who were opposed to enabling that data to be collected on privacy grounds. Mm. So a couple things to react to there. Sarah, have you a comment on Michael's uh, sure, observation? Sure, thanks. thanks, Michael. I agree the record, uh, the data linkage is the way to go, and uh, continuing to work with StatCan and other uh, data custodians to, to do that would be, I guess, ideal to be able to link the social, the survey data that I've been using with Rye and uh, with um, vital statistics as well would be ideal. Um, the compression of income and, you know, we, we understand, we do see evidence of uh, in, in a greater number of seniors in that lower income quintile if you're using the full age distribution to make your quintiles. Um, so yes, that could be one reason why we're not seeing much income in effect. But what I ran out of time and didn't get to show you was my the next slide, which showed a very strong income gradient in the use of non-professional home care. So that's this those personal support services pr provided by personal support workers where the publicly funded personal support services are heavily distributed toward the lower income groups. And the private services, the private only, so the, those who opted out, are heavily skewed towards the richer seniors. So I don't think it's just the compressed income, but uh, it, it could be playing a role. But yeah, so I, I uh, think that's a great point. Thank you. Vanessa? So I'll, I'll start with your second question first. So in terms of the data collection, because that was the slide that I sk skipped over because I ran out of time. Um, so yes, you're quite right. There was a, quite a rigorous um, data collection, information collection, a disclosure scheme that was established in the original Assisted Human Reproduction Act, and those provisions uh, were unfortunately struck down. I don't know what Health Canada's position was on whether um, you know, they wanted to collect that data or not, or how difficult it might be, but I, I can tell you, again, this is another sort of cautionary tale from the fertility context, is that information collection, the information that collection that's happening now is done on a voluntary basis by the IVF directors. I mean, you have to you have to give credit where credit is due. They have undertaken to collect the data in the absence of any government um, system to do that in order for us to have outcome data and have an idea of what's going on with IVF across the country, but it's voluntary collection. It's not mandatory. There's, n as far as I can tell, not very rigorous auditing of the data, no data verification. Um, the transparency of the information is uh, uneven. So they used to provide, the CFAS used to provide quite rich um, data in the fertility and sterility journal. And the last five years, they have produced a one page press release. So, uh, you know, you'll notice within the last week, the slides with the broken down data is now up there. But collection, you know, information is critical in terms of regulating a particular area of health. And this is another example where government really needs to step in. In terms of incentives uh, for weeding out bad apples, um, I think you're right. There are incentives for the colleges to weed out those bad apples. Um, I guess my concern is I'm not sure that they necessarily have the tools to do that. So, for example, if we go back to the Barwin example, you know, if the college was able to go into his clinic and was inclined to go into his clinic and do some tracing in terms of, you know, patient A was getting sperm B and child C was being born um, and really undertook a, 
a, an extensive investigation or audit of that clinic, then you know they would be able to have weeded out what is clearly a bad apple in their profession. But I'm not sure that the colleges have the tools to do that at this stage. Um, and so that's one of the real concerns that I have around self-regulation. Uh, Vanessa and Michael, just a note on the privacy question. My memory is that at the moment that I was tabling the assistant human reproduction legislation, my colleague John Manley, who was then Minister of um, Industry, was about to what had tabled the PIPEDA legislation, mm -hmm. uh, personal privacy, and um, it, there was a, an anxiety that we uh, have the two of them uh, coexist comfortably, and I think that was the reason there was some reluctance on the part of Health Canada to uh, require disclosure of information that might have not have been consistent with PIPEDA. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. That would be me. Sandra Azokar, I'm the Executive Director of Friends of Medicare, which is an advocacy organization. And just that, you know, um, what we do is actually promote the protection and expansion of our public health care system. So um, thank you so much for your presentations and, and to all the other previous panelists, because I think it kind of um, actually made me have more questions than answers to what we need to do to make sure that uh, the protection is there for if anything should happen with Dr. Profit. But um, your presentation actually kind of wrapped it up for me in terms of perhaps some of the questions that we should be asking is um, the, the clear definition of what need is. Because home care, when you take it home care, um, is definitely an integral part of our health care system. And if we don't improve our health care, the way that we deliver health care then, sorry, home care, then we're um, not you know, saving down the road in terms of hospital stays and in, in terms of keeping people away from facility living and so forth and so forth. And I'm sure I don't need to say what that implies. Um, IVF is one of those areas where we in Alberta just uh, fought the closure of the only public um, clinic that we had there that closed its door on February 28th. It actually was providing uh, infertility services at a cost recovery model, and they weren't actually losing money, they were making money that was being reinvested into the public system, but they closed it. Um, and if you look at the definition of infertility under the World Health Organization, it's a disease of the reproductive system. So, but we've chosen to find out what's wrong with people, men and women, but we've decided that um, medical remedies is not something that we're willing to pay for. So in a lot of ways, we are kind of not really clearly defining in whose role would it be to define what medically essential is. And when we're talking about regulations, is it, are we provincially, are these regulations provincially supposed to be in place or federally in place? Because when we're talking about home care, for example, the, the federal government decided not to renew the health accord. Um, they instead uh, entered into bilateral deals that have home care as one of the incentives for provinces to sign into these bilateral agreements. But there's no real definition of how home care fits into um, our bigger health care system. There's really no leadership at the federal level. So, you know, the question about regulation, and it has come up um, numerous times. Uh, throughout this conference is I, I'm still not clear as to who, if we want to have a very well protected public health care system, a Canadian health care system, I mean, given the fact that the provinces decide who gets what, but, um, and the colleges, I just need to kind of be able to go into the last panel with a little bit of an answer. Okay. Sarah? Um, I don't have an answer. Those are all good questions. Uh, a couple of thoughts that came to my mind. Uh, you know, Canada's unique um, in its just you know the way it funds home care, um, as with many other non-Medicare services. Internationally, um, we look at. I mentioned that home care spending is really low in Ontario, but it's also uh, the design is unusual in Canada, where many countries have integrated home care into their national insurance systems. Um, Belgium is the top spender in terms of its uh, percentage spend on home care, and it has you know, decided to embed it in a broader uh, system that's universal. So it's, it's in a unique uh, context, but I, I don't have an answer for who, who should do what, but the, the shared health priorities is a good example of, you know, home care is on the agenda, and uh, at least in terms of improved access, but no sign of changes to regulation. 
Vanessa, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't have an answer either. That's a, you know, it's a big question. How do we decide what's in and what's out? Um, Colleen has written extensively about uh, that those processes. Um, you know, I think in terms of IVF as a particular example and fertility services as a particular example, we see across the country that there has been various attempts at funding IVF. Uh, and assisted insemination and not. Some have worked, some haven't. Quebec did, had a very generous funding program for uh, three or four years and it just cost the province so much money that they decided they needed to allocate that budget to other f forms of health care. Um, we've got a, a more restrictive program now in Ontario. Some provinces provide tax rebates. But again, I think the bigger question is, you know, how do we make these decisions? Um, I think yesterday's panelists came up as well. You know, these are, you know, we have to make trade-offs and decisions about what is going to be paid for and what isn't going to be paid for in the healthcare system. And, you know, we need to be brave about having the conversations that we're going to pay for some things and there's other things that we can't pay for. Brian, have you a comment on the question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the, on the question of, uh, I mean, the, the, the vagueness of our definition of medical necessity is partly by design, obviously, because you want to have a kind of shifting standard of what is in and out of the basket for Medicare. I mean, it just makes sense. As technologies evolve, you want to be able to, you know, sub in new promising new technologies and new healthcare services and take out ones that are outdated. Um, so it's, so that's why the Canada Health Act is, doesn't define a basket of care, but something that Colleen has argued for and that other people have argued for is that you could integrate into the Canada Health Act a kind of principle of accountability and say that there should be some arms like agency, say, that is tasked with deciding what is in and outside the, in and out of the basket, what for explaining to the public the rationale for those choices and having kind of public record about why those choices are made and so that you could scrutinize it and see if there's been discrimination or any sort of problems with the, the, the rationality that underlies it. So it's, uh, you're, you've got your finger on, the, on a key problem in Canadian healthcare, I think, and uh, so but I don't have the perfect answer for you. Thank you, Brian. Yes, doctor. Hi, uh, my name is, oh, sorry, my name is Daniel or Dan Raz. I'm a family physician from St. Mike's. Uh, could you turn your mic up a bit so we yeah. can hear you up here? Thank you. Is this, uh, is this better? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a family physician from St. Mike's, a faculty member at U of T and chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare. Uh, so my question's for Brian, but it's open to the whole panel. Um, and it's, you know, I'll, I think I'll, I'll preface it by saying, I'm sorry, I hate doing that because it sounds like I'm giving a speech. <laughs> um, you know, one of the characteristics, not just of dual practice, but of when we talk about parallel financing of health systems, um, in public versus private is, you know, when we want to direct resources or we want to bolster the public system, it often involves highlighting its shortcomings and in a sense almost denigrating it to get governments to pay attention and invest. But for those advocates who want more private financing, it's the exact opposite. You, you know, you're highlighting um, its most positive aspects and you're de-emphasizing the negative ones so you can attract more clients, more paying customers. Uh, and so that, I feel like, shapes the narrative mm -hmm. around private financing. But I'm curious specifically, uh, Brian, when you looked at the UK and at other European examples, if that sort of dynamic in the public and political conversation shaped how um, different countries engaged with uh, their approach to dual practice um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how that played out amongst uh, the, the professional community and physicians uh, and also the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting. That, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm, I can't. I have to be honest. It's a very insightful comment. I, I have not seen any anything in the literature about that specific sort of dynamic. Um, I know that the. I mean, in the case of the NHS, the uh, the issue was basically just a kind of. NHS physicians wanting to retain some freedom to engage in dual practice and wanting to retain their uh, professional autonomy and so on. Um, but there was nothing of this sort of dynamic you're describing of this kind of like who's defending the public system on its own. So unfortunately, I don't have any real insights to offer you. Maybe someone else does, but. Vanessa or Sarah? Michael, you're double dipping? No, no, just a quick comment and a response to yours on Pipetta. Yes. At the time we were discussing this with uh, that organization whose name I can't remember, I was in Statistics Canada, and we were proposing to collect the data under the Statistics Act, so Pipetta was not the impediment at all. It okay. was perfectly legal what we were proposing. It's a symptom of what I more generally feel is a privacy chill in this country when it comes to collecting information that might actually for real hold some people accountable who are 
who have powerful vested interests. So the question at the time was whether to extend this information to the umbrella of the uh, of Statistics Canada's collection practice. Yes, it would be collected under the Statistics Act. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, in the absence of other questions, it remains only for me to express on behalf of all of you our gratitude to the panel. Three terrific presentations that provided some very useful advice on practical things we can do in preparing ourselves for whatever might happen in the future. So on your behalf, thank you to Brian, Vanessa, and Sarah. Terrific. <laughs>